Hello and welcome to this Q&A series where we explore the practice of studio artists working at Montserrat. Montserrat has a rich and diverse studio artist program with 24 artists working on site and continuing the tradition of art being made and shared at Montserrat for the past nine decades. At the upcoming Montserrat Arts Festival, our 24 studio artists will open their studio doors to you. This is a special day of the year where you can meet and chat with the artists, gain insight into their artistic process and even purchase some of their originals. You will be able to explore our diverse community of emerging to well-established artists across various mediums and disciplines, including painters, sculptors, jewellers, puppeteers, and many more. The Arts Festival was set to take place on October 3rd. However, due to the current circumstances, the festival has been postponed. We are very excited to announce the new date, Sunday, November 21. For a glimpse into what to expect at the festival, we speak with five of our studio artists to share some of their recent work their practice and how they have operated as artists working and creating during the pandemic. I'm Rachel Duffy, the Program Coordinator here at Montserrat. And I'm Sarah Lamado, and I'm currently undertaking an Arts Management Internship at Montserrat. Together we speak with oil painter Angela Abbott, graphite and watercolourist Molly McPhee, painter and illustrator Mary Geyer, sculptor Jean-Paul Zuliakis, and public art designer Amanda Grant. Can you give us a brief introduction to your practice and artistic background? My main arts practice is sculpture, um, uh, figurative sculpture. Um, my background is, oh God, uh, Rudolf Steiner School to begin with. Um, and then really on the arts background, uh, Rudolf Steiner School to begin with in Sydney and then coming to Montsalvat when I was about 19, 18, 19, I think, and learning off Matcham Skipper. I trained as an illustrator about 20 years ago, and then I did a yoga training course and things changed. I started painting. I started seeing these images, so I decided to just go straight to canvas, and, I was, and I've been painting like that ever since, so about 20 years of painting oils. But I still do some illustration, um, I still like to, you know, sketch and draw and stuff. Um, so that's that's what I've been doing for 20 years and only taken it full time since uh, August last year. I well um, studied art a thousand years ago, as I would insist on saying, um, and went to the National Gallery and did uh, um, drawing studies with Ian Armstrong. Um, this is in the 60s. And uh, then was uh, with him for a couple of years and was always looking for a, a painting teacher, I think, who would lead me along the path that I sort of intuitively felt I wanted to follow. And that was to um, sort of express, but, but sort of capture for real what was in front of me, uh, but also um, trying to maintain that freshness, that, that sort of move, implied movement, I guess I'd call it, um, which appealed to me so much. My practice is a little bit difficult to, to explain. Um, I'm basically a designer and I mainly work with public art. So I um, take things from concept to right through to installation. So um, what I do is um, I usually start with sort of community engagement, um, learning about the, um, the site, the themes, the, the purpose of the piece. Um, and then I work with other artisans to, um, to manufacture it. I work with engineers. Um, I organise all the sort of the footings and installation and everything and then finish up with the finished piece. So my background is a bit of a mixture. It's in um, metal fabrication, so welding, a little bit of uh, forging and uh, graphic design and illustration. So I do um, a lot of consulting. Um, I sometimes do some commercial work and branding and things like that. Um, but a lot of it based around sort of design and illustration. I tend to work in watercolour, um, sometimes graphite, sometimes gouache I've been experimenting with. But mostly I yeah, use watercolour to do sort of natural history style paintings. Um, botanical, that sort of thing. Um, I, uh, growing up, went to a Steiner school, so that sort of um, encouraged my creativity and there was a big focus on sort of drawing, painting, all that sort of 
creating fun stuff. Um, and then uh, I haven't actually studied at university art, but um, I've always sort of continued my practice growing up and done a few short courses in sort of, again, natural history illustration. Um, and I do a like a community class, um, usually once a week in botanical illustration as well. What have you been working on recently? Can you tell us about a recent artwork or project yeah. of yours? Well, I'm working towards my first solo exhibition at the end of this year with, um, with you guys at Montalvet. <laughs> so it's been very exciting. Um, it's a yeah, new experience for me. I haven't done a solo exhibition before. Um, so it's been a lot of work. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so I'm focusing sort of on um, local endangered and threatened species. Um, so painting a lot of little animals and plants, which has been really great. And through that, I've sort of been learning a lot about the different um, species as well. So I'm really hoping that I can make some lovely pieces of art, but that also um, sort of help to bring awareness to, yeah, things that like species that people might not really know about. Um, so I figure people can't care about things if they don't know about them. So I was fortunate, even though um, we're in lockdown, I could still come to Monsalvat, not for the classes, which was actually very timely because I had um, I have two commissions, uh, the lion behind me and another one which I can't show because the lady who's bought the lion knows what it is, whereas this other lady doesn't. So it's a really big piece. It's 2.4 by 1.4 um, <clears throat> for a private home. So I've been working on that so and, and my classes. The fundamentals of drawing, that's quite structured for people who are real beginners. So it's an eight week course and it takes, um, it, each class builds on the last class. So at the end, you have all the tools and elements that if you wanted to draw something, you just have to go back and say, how did I do that? And you can go back. So from doing, you know, lovely to do it in my studio, but because of our situation, I've put it together so where I normally demonstrate, I've drawn that, uploaded it, send it off with a file. So even though I'm demonstrating and it can't be seen clearly, they've got a hard copy which they can actually keep and refer to. I just did a portrait of Hamish Knox, um, which has turned out okay. He's happy with it. Um, and I've been, been told that people can recognise the sculpture as Hamish, so that's always good. Um, yeah, you know, when you're doing figurative sculpture, the idea is that you've got something that should be recognisable, I guess. It took us about 10 sittings of about an hour long each. So 10 hours to get a, a decent portrait of somebody. I, I, I must admit though, on that kind of level of, of the process, my, my process is pretty sort of simple. I look at somebody and I try and make a piece of clay look like them. I've got a piece that, um it's sort of just finishing up now so um, this is the war memorial sculptures in Greensboro War Memorial Park so there are a series of um, carved cypress sculptures um, known as Homefront and um, we've just got lights on them now so they were finished a while ago the actual pieces um, but the lights have just um, came on I don't think a couple of weeks ago and I haven't seen them yet because we've been in lockdown um, and we're going to be working on um, a sign for the area and some little QR codes to link it all up to the website so um, yeah that's that's been a really interesting piece so that started off years ago um, when I was um, working with um, Banyal City Council and um, interviewing um, war veterans, local war veterans and getting their stories and um, the series of sculptures is in, it's not a, not directly illustrating their stories but it's picking up um, little pieces of their stories and themes and, and sort of uh, using their stories as inspiration. Yes, I can undoubtedly say yes, um, with a for forthcoming exhibition at Montsalvat, um, and it's a retrospective, which I have never tackled before, but at my stage of life, I felt it was very important that I did it. Um, this is over a year ago. I had this uh, great thought that I should do it, um, and it's been an absolutely wonderful journey. Um, so it's taken me, I guess, a full year of collating, of selecting, of um, cross-referencing, of of getting work into decades so it's it really represents five plus decades of my artistic or working life um, and that has given me huge challenges and I've enjoyed every minute of it it's been 
incredibly hard work but and taken an awfully long time but I've really enjoyed seeing the um, I suppose in a way that's very moi centric but it's and I'm not used to this and I don't hopefully over project at any time but this is more about Monsalvet than me and I'm just really enjoying that just tying everything in um, from my I hope I think very objective um, viewpoint of coming in every week and uh, spending a whole day there and really noticing um, from a distance what's going on um, whether it's the actual physicality or whether it's the the humans that populate Monsal that the visitors the, the artist in residence the whole the, everything every creature that moves at Monsal that um, so it's been wonderful seeing the changes over the years how has lockdown been for you and being creative? Yeah, I think in the first couple of weeks before I found out I could come to Monsalvat um, on my own, um, it was hard to keep that motivation going in the first couple of weeks. But what I found to do was keep looking at other artists' works, uh, flick through books, um, just sketch even at night, you know, just do something. So then I, when I came here, I thought, fantastic, I'll be able to work from here and keep that going but that's also a discipline because without people at Monsal that it's not the same I love when I see people walking past and stuff and people come in and talk so it's really um, a discipline to say no I'm here to do it to do what I love and it doesn't matter that no one's around because who knows how long um, so you yeah, play lots of music listen to good good inspiring podcasts and keep myself company that way. I think I've turned to like reading a lot of books, which has helped sort of, you know, um, yeah, losing yourself in other worlds and that sort of thing helps you to sort of spark your own creativity, I think. A lot of my, um, my efforts has been, um, I guess, sort of keeping projects going. And so there's been a lot more admin and a lot more sort of communicating with people and, and trying to sort of connect online all the time um, and I deal with a lot of people that don't do online stuff like they don't they don't even do email really so um, I kind of lost communication with with a few of the, the people that I normally work with um, so yeah it's been really challenging so I've, I've found it really um, it's been a bit dry and a bit bureaucratic <laughs> so not I wouldn't say it's been a creative time I've had little creative pockets but, but nothing like it should be <laughs> I laugh apart from getting ready for my exhibition which is all consuming um, I have really enjoyed the chance to work in my studio at home which is nothing like Monsal that studio it's, it's very uh, <laughs> very cut and dried it hasn't got the lovely as as I said before, the lopsidedness of Monsal, that it hasn't got the quirkiness, it hasn't got the uh, age, it hasn't got lots of things, but it gives me a lovely chance to be objective, think about Monsal, that. Um, I've set up still lifes during lockdown at home um, last year, mainly flowers because it was springtime when everything seemed to burst into action. And uh, so I did quite a lot of still lifes and uh, and after that ventured out a little bit um, and closer to home painting things like people wearing masks in parks and and, <laughs> and uh, just just capturing a little bit of the times we live in at the moment. No, in so much as I've had my partner up and I've been doing some sculptures of her. Um, and oh, the grounds work as well you know like you could argue that doing grounds work here is uh art restoration or art conservation when it comes to it so part of fixing up the grounds here is sort of like a you could have you i guess you could describe montsalvat as a giant sculpture in some ways um that you made and which needs to be carefully maintained so part of that has been during lockdown as well, because I live here, I can I can continue to work here. Would you say that your approach to your art practice has changed since being at home compared to your studio? Yes, it's... Um, I had an exhibition here at Monsal Valley in March and I knew I wanted to start a new, start a new series. When I was at home, I, I, I was my mind was saying, what's the point? So, but when I got here, I went, well, this is the point. So the series that I have 
in my head is to do animals next, you know, and basically to animals that are going into uh, uh, extinct, you know. Um, but at the same time, in my illustration work, I have a quirkiness. So I kind of want to change my style because it's been quite serious to do still females and stuff, but actually in a quirky way. So to create a bit more of an uplifting. So two, that's two exhibitions. So I don't know, that's a lot of work, but basically um, preserving our wildlife and being a bit more lighthearted because we've had pretty, you know, as we all know, hard times. <laughs> so that, that's what's happened by coming here and not staying at home. And I have to admit that's been I'm excited now to do that. So that sort of overrides any negative about being in lockdown. So I really love going to Monster Bay because I know I'm just going there just to focus on my work and I can sort of just, you know, lose myself in my little bubble there. <laughs> but at home, it's, um, I think it takes a little bit more uh, discipline <laughs> to make yourself really sit down and, and do the work. I'm very limited. I need people to model. I need things to, uh, to, how do I put this? To focus my artistic creation on. If someone's interested in sitting, I'm usually interested in making a modeling of them because everybody's face is interesting. Everybody's face is unique. Um, and I, I think what makes it a beautiful sculpture is that it looks like them. That's, that's actually what the goal is, rather than, you know, I, I, I guess that's where if you look back in, into antiquity, you know, you've got the idea of the Greeks who, uh, how do I say this, refined people, you know, they, they tried to make them look better than they were. The Romans were masters of, of realism. You know, if you had a broken nose, you were depicted with a broken nose. If you had a, a weird chin, you were depicted with a weird chin. You know, it was, it was, I don't know if it was just egotism, but I think it was uh, a pragmatism of I am what I am, not as I should be, which I think is sort of relevant when you think about it in modern context where we are so assaulted by other people's uh, projections upon what we should be. You know, rather than just what you are. Spot on. How do people often respond to their own portraits um, when they see them, when you're finished with them? Oh, they're usually pretty tickled, actually. They're usually pretty tickled. They, they usually... Um, it's interesting. Like, I've done maybe four portraits of Damien now, and each one's different. So, much as I might strive for realism, there's still a certain... Um, there's a striving for, not a succeeding in. Um, and I, I think the better a person sits, the better a modeling I end up with. And generally they, generally I think they're very flattered. You know, someone took the time to make something of them. Is there any art that you have turned to in this time for inspiration? Um, probably looking through the books, the many, many books in, in my studio, um, enjoying really, really old master paintings and, and more, and a, a, wide, a wide range of paintings. Um, I think probably, uh, yeah, and exhibitions too. I've been minding uh, voluntarily an exhibition when I've been able to in the last year and looking at various uh, works within the gallery, which has ranged from Aboriginal um, women's art to um, in in the central desert and northern desert, uh, which was wonderful. Um, and looking at works by um, Melbourne artists, um, I've really um, been broadened, I think, by their approaches. I would hope so. Certainly, I've responded to it in my own um, inner way. Um, and and so I think a lot of those things are influential. I follow quite a lot of artists just like on Instagram and um, on YouTube, especially um, one artist I really admire, is her name is Zoe Keller. She's from America and she sort of, um, she does massive graphite pieces that um, really focus on lots of local species and their environments and habitats. So she's had a big influence on sort of the way I like to work as well. But um, yeah, so I've looked to a lot of her work and uh, she actually runs she did like in 
October, lots of people do this Inktober challenge where you're doing your artwork every day. So I did hers last year, which was looking at just different animals. We do a different animal every day. But this year she's actually, I think, knowing because it's um, locked down, you know, pandemic, not everyone's feeling super motivated to create. She's actually just sort of set up a playlist of all different um, sort of podcasts about different environmental issues that you can listen to. And um, I found that, yeah, I've just started listening to that um, through October and it's quite interesting and, yeah, it can spark some ideas there. So that's, that's been really cool. There has been a little piece that's popped up in the news um, lately, which, which is just gorgeous. And it's a, an artist called, I think, um, a, a Tong Atem, I think is her name. And um, she has done a big 2D piece in South Bank and she's covered this building with um, I guess it's a bit of a theme here, a sort of a 1970s wallpaper design. And then she's put like neon over the top of it. And it's like, it's got this amazing sort of kitschy kind of cool look to it. I just absolutely love it. I'm so excited. It's in Melbourne. I can't wait to see it. I've got it. I've got a bit of a thing for neon. <laughs> so 70s wallpaper plus neon. I just, I think she's brilliant. I just, so that got me really excited. <laughs> So I think I think it um, had a story broadsheet recently, so you can you can look it up. Personally, meditate every morning and write. Um, I've always I've done it for years. Sometimes I, I go off, but it's after doing some meditation and writing out how you feel. It's like we shower the body. It's nice to shower the mind, and then when you do that, so if you're feeling a little bit apprehensive, well, if I was feeling a little bit, what's 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 the point? Um, once I do that, I sort of get a different spring in my step because then once you're clear, you let other ideas pour in. And I think that's what's been happening because I do have the time to do that. So the idea for the new works is pouring in. So do you prioritise meditation in the morning rather than at night as a sort of way of starting the day? Yeah, I do. I have for 20 years um, and, and writing. Um, and you know, and in saying that, my workshop, I thought, how can I do this online? And I had all these ideas. And after a meditation, it just came out. Right, three hours, three hours, block that, block that. They learn this, they learn that. And uh, then I shared it with my coach, it was wonderful. Like it just came into place. So it frees the mind, the logical mind to be creative, which is what, you know, we all do here. It's funny, since I've been in the new studio, the old dining room, um, I've wanted to listen to Indigenous music and that seems to ground and also connect. So that's really what has inspired me to um, feel part of a whole. What are you most looking forward to on your return to Montserrat? Ah, yeah, I think the sounds, the sounds rather than anything. Um, the feel of the place. It's the studio, of course, um, which has wonderful light, which is pretty well due south. Um, it's, it's great. Um, we have a wonderful line system that we can lock out the light and get total. Oh, well, not total. You never get total block out, but you get you can control the light um, to a degree. Um, but of course, there are at the moment when I do open the blinds a little bit which I do occasionally to see the peacocks sitting on the chimney pots outside the studio and to see what sort of day it is when you're inside in darkness if you have to control the light like that um, it's just so wonderful to see the clouds scudding past and the the trees are stripped of their leaves in winter and the seasons the new leaves coming of course at the moment fresh I'm sure I'm just imagining this um, going by what I see here locally um, it's it, it'll be all those sounds and sights and and the fact that it's alive that artists in residence are back creating that uh, Monsalvat's ethos continues in this lovely unbroken way it's it's unbroken by COVID I think it's just there and um and and open for everybody to to access and and enjoy oh having people around I'm a bit of a, a bit of a um a social sort of a person I love having company and do you think those interactions with uh other people and everything uh come into your art at all yeah I think so and you know like on as I said I I I require people um as a muse so part of part of that 
is making a relationship with them to then be able to make their portrait. Jean-Paul, can you tell us when we're walking around the Montserrat grounds, we can often find your sculptures um, in little places around the property. Whose faces can we see and what should we look out for? Um, oh, um, well, there's, there's a, a fair bit of sculpture around Montsylvain. Um, uh, mostly Marcus Skippers and Matcham Skippers. Mine are mostly the portraits, um, the heads, the disembodied heads lying around in the grounds. I'm so excited to get back. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, I love the atmosphere there and it's just, it's always, I just feel immediately calm and happy to be there and just even to walk around the gardens is always like, you know, something to, to, to inspire you. I think some quiet space is going to be really good and some room to, um, to set up my easels. I haven't, um, I haven't picked up a paintbrush for a really long time and um, that kind of hurts after a while. Um, and I just, I just haven't had the room here. So, so getting back to painting is going to be really good and, and doing, doing some more illustration. So on um, November 21, we have the Montsalvat Arts Festival. What can people expect to see in your studio on that day? I might be casting some things. Uh, I might be showing some of my little buildings. Um, I might uh, have some of my modellings out, just showing what I've been doing. I'll leave them as a surprise, but I do have a couple of pieces that people can come and um, and sit in or on. One of them was one of them won the packing room prize at the Nilambic Prize a few years ago, so I'm going to be bringing that one in. Um, and the other is a is a piece I built with a friend a couple of years ago. So they they're kind of they're not really. Oh, I don't know how to describe them. <laughs> they're, you can sit in them. They're interesting. <laughs> So, so bring, bring your bring your selfie sticks. I hope people will come by and say hello, um, ask me heaps of questions. I'm hopefully going to be doing some work. I'm not exactly sure what I'll be working on. I'm hoping all of my pieces for my exhibition will be finished by then. So I'll probably be working on something new. Um, so you'll have to come by and have a look and see what I'm up to. Um, and yeah, we're going to run a little children's activity as well, hopefully. I'm doing a little nature scavenger hunt, so to come by and say hello. <laughs> well, they can see all my work, well, most of my work that's up. I'm also running um, 15 minute testers or tasters of the workshop. Um, every hour and a half, I think, and once all that, we'll do an online booking for that. Um, and also, the other exhibition I had was Works on Paper called Isolation, and that's, a, that's just a really fun way of drawing things without. Uh, you look at your, well, it was humans that I looked at. So I looked at humans, but not at the paper and didn't take my pen off and develop these drawings. So there'll be little testers of that for people to have a go. Once we open our doors to come again, you know, especially the festival, connect with all the artists, you know, because um, being creative, I think, during these times, even if it's only cooking, uh, which I've done a lot of different kind of baking and stuff, um, being creative just helps you centre, you know, than just staying in your left brain and, you know, all the worries that we've got with this stuff. Um, so I'm just saying be creative, try something. And if you think you can't draw a paint, you know, you'll be surprised. I will draw it out of you. <laughs> of course, visitors can come and see your exhibition on that day and also um, hear you give an artist talk in the morning. Uh, what um, else? Yes. What can people expect from you and your studio on the day? I think um, Don and Adam will be there, I presume, painting as usual. And as I have joined in painting there, or else I have painted out by the, usually the so-called Monet Pond, um, which I don't think the founders called Monet, but we uh, sort of become a Monet Pond because of the willows and occasionally the little dinghy that was <laughs> beached by the side of the pond and a pond which sometimes has water in and most often in summer doesn't. Um, so I've painted up there often on the open um, arts festival day and sometimes in the studio with Don and Adam and students. Um, so the studio will be open and people will be able to engage with the studio, meet the studio and meet the artists and see them uh, at work. Um, 
on still lives, usually dictated by the, the studio um, condition. And I hope to see people at the, uh, the Wonderful Arts Open Day and, uh, and also fellow artists and uh, people back at Monsalvat in that community. So thank you so much. We'd like to thank all of the artists for speaking with us and providing an insight into their world throughout lockdown. We hope you enjoyed this video and I invite you to join our artists at the Montserrat Arts Festival on Sunday, November 21. You can find information about the program and ticketing at our website, montserrat.com.au.